Support for On Being with Krista Tippett comes from the Fetzer Institute, helping build the spiritual foundation for a loving world. Fetzer's new study, What Does Spirituality Mean to Us?, reveals how spirituality informs our understanding of ourselves and each other and inspires us to take action for the common good. Explore these findings and more at spiritualitystudy.org. Resma Menakem is a therapist and trauma specialist who activates the wisdom of elders and a very new science about how all of us carry the history and traumas behind everything we condense into the word race in our bodies. He helps explain why vulnerabilities and inequities laid bare by the pandemic have fallen hardest on black bodies. He illuminates why all of the best laws and diversity training have not gotten us anywhere near healing. We recorded this interview just before lockdown in Minneapolis, where we both live and work. We offer up Resma Menachem's intelligence on changing ourselves at a cellular level. As, in Minneapolis and beyond, this nation again confronts terrible patterns that have crossed so many generations. And I'm grateful that I was able to speak with him across a table pre-social distancing. He was watching me as much as listening to my words as he shared practices towards the transformed reality I believe most of us long to inhabit. So you just did something that I think is very important. Okay. Okay. If anybody could see me, I physically like... You braced. You was like, no, your face turned red, right? Like the whole thing, just like, no, right? But see, that's where you start. Mm-hmm. Right there, yeah. right. Not in this. Let's bring everybody in and make them all comfortable. Bodies of culture are uncomfortable every day. White people have the luxury of not being so. I'm Krista Tippett, and this is on being. Resma Menakem has worked with U.S. military contractors in Afghanistan, as well as American communities and police forces. He's the author of a wonderful book, part narrative, part workbook. My Grandmother's Hands, Racialized Trauma and the Pathway to Mending Our Hearts and Bodies. You know, I am curious. um, I've read you and listened to you. I'm always curious, like, you know, what people's passion and calling become. And it feels to me like it's right here in the title of the book, Your Grandmother's Hands. That's it. That's it. My grandmother, the women in my family, you know, I, I have this sense. So when the idea of, of humanness came about, the first representation of that was the black woman. Hmm. Now, I'm not fighting nobody about that. <laughs> that is, for me, where it starts. And so my grandmother and my mother and the black women in my life have always been that protector and that nurturer and that person that would get at your butt, right, and say, yeah, you can do it and let's keep moving. And my wife, Hmm. right? And so for me, my grandmother and, and the story I talk about with her hands is that piece around creation and emergence even in the midst of anguish and horror. Yeah. Right? So describe her hands. So my grandmother, my grandmother was not a very big woman, right? I would, <laughs> this is going to be funny. <laughs> I would say skinny, stout woman, right? She was stout, but she was she was not a big woman, okay. right? And she would hum and, and all of this different type mm. of stuff. Mm. My grandmother used to always shake her hand and complain of arthritis, and so she used to lay on the couch. So we would be watching the Bucks game or something like that. My grandmother loved the Milwaukee Bucks. So we would be sitting there, and then she would drape her her legs across our lap, and then her hand would rest on her thigh, and she would turn the other way and be watching TV. And so we would just rub her hands, right? And, yeah. I, and I can't remember the exact age of what I was, but I was rubbing her hands one day, and I was comparing her hands to my hands. Yeah. And so I'm rubbing them, and I'm rubbing them. And I go, Grandma, and this was a half joking. I had the tonal quality in my voice. There was a half joke there, right? And I said, Grandma, why are your hands so fat like that? Yeah. As I'm rubbing her hands. And without missing the beat, my grandmother didn't even look at me. She goes, oh, boy, that's from picking cotton. And I sat there. And I'm like, from picking cotton? And she, she must have picked up the tone. And she looked at me and saw me. And she goes, boy, you ever seen a cotton plant? 
And that's the quality that was in her throat. And I'm like, no. She takes her other hand and she does her hands like this. She goes, them damn cotton plants got a burr in them. They got a burrs in them like that. And she goes, I started walking up and down them roads when I was four years old. And she said, as you're walking up and down the roads, you put your hands in, them cotton plants rip your hands up. And so when they rip your hands up, your hands bleed. And this is the tonal quality she's having in her throat. Right. Now, I don't know what that is, but I know it's something I need to pay attention to. Right. And so I'm looking at her. So you're feeling what's going on in her body as right. much as the words she's saying. That's right. Right yeah. there. That's, yeah. the, that, that's the energy. You know, yeah. um, Einstein said, energy cannot be created nor destroyed, but it can be thwarted. It can be manipulated. It can be moved around. When we're talking about trauma, when we're talking about historical trauma, intergenerational trauma, persistent institutional trauma, and personal traumas, whether that be childhood, adolescence, or adulthood, those things, when they are left constricted, right, yeah. be, you begin to be shaped around the constriction. And they are, it is wordless. Time decontextualizes trauma. So when my grandmother is saying that, mm-hmm. I need to pay attention to that, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And for her, it's decontextualized. So would, so she doesn't even have a context for it, right. right? And so as she's saying that, I said, oh. And then she said, yeah. And then she turned back and started watching TV again. <laughs> and so those types of things is what started... Like, I've always thought about this type of stuff, but there were pretty seminal things that happened in my life that made it so I was able to actually sit down and write it and put things in place. And here's the interesting thing about the book is that I believe, like, when bodies of culture come up to me and talk to me, if a black woman or or indigenous woman or somebody comes up to me and talk to me, the one thing that they all say is... I've been thinking this my whole life. Mm -hmm. And then when I read it in your book, it made me feel like I wasn't crazy. Because racialization makes us walk around like we're crazy. Like the things that are vibratorily happening to us, the images that are happening, the meaning, all of that different type. The fact that we we walk around with this braceness, right? Because we're infected by this idea that the white body is the supreme standard, right? And I've done workshops where I've said, just said to the people in there, the the bodies of culture, I've looked at them and I said, you are not defective. Just saying that you know, tears start to well up in people's faces. You know, I feel like um, one way I've thought about this time we're living in, Mm -hmm. um, you know, I was born in 1960. Mm. So like those of us who lived through the 60s, although I mean, I was a child, but still it's in my body too. That's right. Um, There was a lot of progress. Mm -hmm. It felt like a lot of progress Mm -hmm. was made. A lot of new laws were passed Mm -hmm. that were revolutionary in their way. Mm -hmm. And certainly, I mean, it's true in many areas, including with gender, you know, with the relationship between women. But it's absolutely true with with race or on race. And I felt like we changed the laws, but we didn't change ourselves. And to me, what you speak into that Mm -hmm. very concretely you know, you say, we tried to teach our brains to think better about race, mm-hmm. right? which, you know, makes sense. Like, it felt like that was a good That's idea, right. but it didn't take us. It's, we we tried to work on it in terms of ideology and public policy and politics. But, you know, you have this radical statement that while we see anger and violence in the streets of our country, the real battlefield is inside our bodies. Mm-hmm. In all of our, I mean, I'm saying this, all of our bodies. Yeah. Of every color. Yeah. You say, if we are to survive as a country, it is inside our bodies mm-hmm. where this conflict needs to be resolved. Mm-hmm. That the vital force between white supremacy is in our nervous systems. Yeah, yeah. I mean, just watching you say that, right? Yes. This, this is why I, I talk the way that I talk, right? So, so let me start with just a definition first. Yeah. So the premise of the work is predicated on the idea that there was a certain time where the white body became the supreme standard by which all bodies' humanity shall be measured. If you don't understand that, everything about America will confuse you. Everything about racialization will Mm -hmm. confuse you. So I have white people that call me, contact me, want to do, uh, want, want me to come and do some consulting with them, stuff like that. Yeah. And one of the things I'm always clear about is that 
if you can't say the term yeah. white body supremacy. Mm-hmm. But that's a, that you're nuancing the term yeah. in a really useful way yeah. and a way that I'm is operationalizing in, it. Yes. Yeah. Yes. The white body is used to hearing things that make it comfortable. Mm-hmm. Right. And so when you say something like white supremacy, right, especially here in Minnesota, everybody goes, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Right. And then what happens is it goes the, just the term like mm-hmm. white supremacy mm-hmm. is a very intellectual term. It doesn't land in the body. No, because also, as you point out, most people th- think, but that's not me. That's not me. Right? Yes, I want to talk about it, but you're not talking about me. I'm a that's good right. person. You're talking about them. You're talking about, right? You're talking about my mean uncle, mm-hmm. 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 right? Mm-hmm. Let me give you one quick example. Recently, I got asked to come and talk to uh, like 300 people who were DEI. And di- we say diversity, diversity equity, equity, inclusion. And inclusion, yeah. right? Yeah. And even when you say it, everybody kind of like, the eyes get dreamy, right? It's like, the, oh, diversity, equity, inclusion, right? right? But if you don't define what that means, yeah. it can mean Taco Tuesday. It can mean, you know, Collard Green Wednesday. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. It can be anything that's kind of a cursory. Yeah. Yeah. So one of the questions that I asked when I went to this thing and they asked me to come, yes, we really want you to be here. And that was my white voice. We really want you to come here and do this <laughs> thing. And, you know, yeah. <laughs> so, thank you. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. But, 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 but so, so, so what happened was I asked one question. I said, how many people in here believe in diversity? Everybody shot their hands up. Yep. Boom. Everybody. I said, answer this one next question. And, they, and I said, don't, don't bring your hands down. Answer this question. Diverse from what? Right. Because when you say diversity, yeah. that means you start someplace first and then you diversify from it. I know. Right? Hands start coming down. Because we all know it intrinsically. Yeah. Right? But if you don't say it, then it's not operational. Yeah. And white comfort trumps my liberation. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. Even even bodies of culture genuflect to white comfort because we know when white people get nervous, people lose their jobs. When white people get nervous, mm-hmm. people get hung from trees. Mm-hmm. When white people get nervous, babies get put in cages. Mm. So I want to back up a little bit and talk about your particular way into this mm-hmm. with the focus on the trauma. Yeah. Uh, that is actually in all of us. Yeah. And you're working with realities that are as old as the human brain and body, but very new science. Yes. And so I'm curious about, um, so, you know, it's the science of trauma. I mean, PTSD, everybody knows that now, but it's just a couple decades That's old. Right. Yeah, right. The whole uh, field of epigenetics about how trauma and resilience get, can cross generations. 14, there's, there's, I just read somewhere it says 14 generations now. 14, right. So this is all new. Mm-hmm. And, you know, as you say, it it's new information that lands like, oh, of course we knew that all along. Yeah, yeah. It's always been there. It's, there's always been this kind of uh, resonant knowing um, that something's there. Haven't, because it's been decontextualized and handed down from my mom, my grandmother, my grandfather, blah, 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 all the way yeah, down. Yeah. I didn't have a language for it, but there was a knowing that this ain't right. Um, that a lot of tra- that they lived through a lot of trauma. Not just that they lived through trauma, but that the angst and the anguish was decontextualized. Right. And so now, so for my black body to be born into a society mm-hmm. by which the white body is the standard is in and of itself traumatizing. Right. If my mom is born as a black woman into a society that predicates her body as deviant, the amount of cortisol that is in her nervous system when I'm being born is teaching my nervous system something. Right. Right? Trauma decontextualized in a person looks like personality. Trauma decontextualized in a family looks like family traits. Trauma in a people looks like culture. Tippett, and this is On Being. Today with clinical therapist and trauma specialist, Resma Menachem. (music) 
So another radical, radical insight that you have, again, like driving back to a core truth, is that that the trauma in black bodies is born not just of white bodies and white people, but of with the history of trauma that white people have inflicted on themselves and each other. That's the piece. That's the piece. Okay, that is just, it's such a revelation to yeah. join those dots. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the idea yeah. that people could go through a thousand years of the dark ages and come out of that unscathed. Right, a thousand five hundred AD to 1500 is when we're talking about when we say the dark ages, yeah, right? Yeah, so so you mean to tell me that the level of brutalization, and the middle ages, and, medieval torture yeah, chambers, right. which yeah, is another, yeah, those are two words that follow yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, um, 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 filleting, whipping. Uh, here, here's the thing land theft, enslavement, yeah, imperialism. Colonialism, yeah. genocide, all of that. You know, the Tower of London that we go to Tower, as a tourist attraction, right. and it's one torture contraption. Plagues. Right, right, right. <laughs> you know, all of this stuff happened for a thousand years. Yeah. And then that body came here. Yeah. Right? This is why I say white people, don't, don't, don't look for a black guru. Don't look for an indigenous guru. Find other white people and start creating a container by which you can begin to work race specifically. Mm -hmm. Not racing this and racing that and racing this and, you know, yeah. bake bread together and do all that. Not that. Not a book club. Right. You specifically deal with the embodiment of race. Right. Mm -hmm. And the energy that's stored with that. Listen, let me say this. The middle and the dark ages set the table for white, poor white people because they had been brutalized by powerful white people, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. It set the table that when powerful white people mm -hmm. in the 1600s came here in America, right. came to poor white people. And we know, people, right, the, the narrative, they fled. That's right. They, they fled. fled. We never they, think these right. are traumatized that, but, so, people. So the other thing that I, th yeah. that I say is that when people talk about mm -hmm. the 13 colonies, mm -hmm. the 13 colonies were filled with colonized white people. Mm -hmm. So 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 what ends up happening is is that when you have that level of brutality mm -hmm. for all that time mm -hmm. and then and then right after the Bacon Rebellion is the first time you start to see in law white persons. Mm -hmm. Not landowners, not merchants, yeah. white persons. That, that, that language. That, yeah. That's right. At yeah. that moment the white body became the standard of humanity. Mm -hmm. Not merchants, not landowners, not the white body, because at oh. that moment, the white body had dominion over and everything else was a deviant, right, from that. And, and then about a couple of years later is when you start to see white persons show up in Virginia law, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. By the time they offered that to poor white people and said, hey, you won't be white? After all of that brutality, white people said, you mean all I got to do is be white and my babies may not have to go through mm -hmm. that? Yeah, I'll take that. Let's take that, right? Mm -hmm. And that was that's what sewed it in. So now they saw their allegiance more with white landowners than the enslaved Africans that they were rebelling it with. Right. Right. But you're also saying that it it was actually a way of co opting poor white people into their that's further the traumatization. That's exactly right. That's why what you see now yeah. is like the flower of the seed of that. That's what right. you're seeing right now. Yeah. And so when you say little things, the body hears, yeah, that's right. They ain't human. Well, one thing that you say, that there's a lot of problems with the way progressives <laughs> approach all this uh, well-meaningly. Um, and one of them is, I just want to find this because it's so... That that rather than creating culture, they create strategies, exactly. which again is a head move. That's exactly it's a right. cognitive exactly move. Exactly right. But that what the the people who are not ready to reckon with this for all these many reasons right. create instead is culture. That's exactly right. Symbols, That's right. stories, music, music. Exactly right. And um, and belonging, and, belonging. and that that's so much more powerful than a that's strategy. Exactly right. So if I'm a thirteen year old white boy. And I get on the internet, 
And I see symbol. I see rules of admonishment, rules of acceptance, right? A tone, a cadence, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Um, A dress, an understanding, a rhythm, Right. These are so I'm not just talking about, you know, just the kind of, you know, the things that we see, you know, the dress and stuff like that. I'm talking about the glue. Right. That the resonant and dissonance glue yeah. that holds things together. And it's about your identity. It's not even necessarily about actions you're going right. to perpetrate against other people. That's right. It's about how you feel it's, inside your body. It's about how it's about how how the re- and this is why I keep coming back to energy. Right. Yeah. And I'm not talking about mystical energy. I'm talking about literally how this yeah. stuff, right? And so one of the things that happens is I'm a 13-year-old white boy. I'm lost. But I'm watching this. And they they have a whole history. Yeah. Even if I know that the history is bunk, right? But it has a beginning, mm-hmm. a middle, mm-hmm. and an end, mm-hmm. right? And we all like a good story, mm-hmm. right? I'm 13, I'm lost. I'm poor. Mm-hmm. And the reason why I'm poor is because of these little Mexicans keep coming over here taking my job. Right. right. The reason why I'm poor is because these black brutes, the only thing that they can do is jump and play football or sing and dance. they taking my job, and I'm the rightful heir. After a short break, more with Resma Menicum. I'm Krista Tippett, and this is On Being, today with trauma specialist Resma Menicum. His book, My Grandmother's Hands, is a completely original contribution, part narrative, part workbook, of old wisdom and very new science around healing racial trauma in our bodies. I sat across from him in Minneapolis, where we both live and work, just before lockdown. Well, I mean, I think it's time to talk about the vagus nerve. Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) Um, So what I want you to help explore I mean, I, you don't have to just talk about the vigorous nerve, but I feel like this is another piece yeah. of knowledge about ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think the way you you apply what we're learning with this to this particular reckoning, yeah. this moment of our you know, possibility yeah. of yeah. becoming more fully human yeah. Yeah. Um, is really, really re- revealing. Yeah. So the vagal nerve is very important. So... Um, so I'm going to ask you a question, Chris. Have you ever been on the phone with somebody that you love, you know, parent, you know, partner, husband, child, and they're talking to you and all of a sudden you go, what's wrong? Yeah. Have you ever had that happen? Yeah. And you don't even know, like, it's not necessarily, they haven't said anything, they ain't sounding particularly sad, but you go, mm. Right? Mm-hmm. 3,000 miles away. Mm-hmm. And I'm picking up on something. And one of the things that I, I talk to people about is that there's this nerve that comes out of the brain stem. And it's called the wandering nerve. And it hits in the face. It hits in the pharynx. It hits in the chest. It hits in the gut. Right? It wanders the whole body. Right? And it, I believe it's one of the things why we have gut reactions. Right? right? right. Because most of that nerve actually ends up in the gut. Right? Yeah. And when we're stressed, that gut constricts or opens. Right. And so one of the things that happens is that if I'm with you long enough, like if me and you become friends, right, Mm -hmm. over time, I will start to hear things in your throat because the vagal nerve is either open or constrict. That's that constriction you heard in your grandmother's That's voice exactly when she right. told you about picking cotton. I needed cotton. to pay attention to that, yeah. even if I didn't know what it was. Yeah. Right. And so it shows up in the eyes. Mm -hmm. It shows up in the mouth. Mm -hmm. This is why when we're tracking each other. Right. We pick up on things. And even if we don't know what it is, we know Mm -hmm. that was something. But as you say, it it also just shows up in the I think to me, the voice carries the body. That's it. Because I what you know, I talk to people a lot about um, about how to have a different kind of conversation. But one thing I'll say, which you just confirm for me and help me understand better is 
so many things pass between us at an animal level before any words are spoken or before the first sentence is complete. Before like you animal. can't fake. You can pretend to That's be right. curious. That's you right. can ask a curious question. If you're not actually curious, right. the other person will respond appropriately. That's right. That's the authenticity piece. Yeah. Right? We're, we're hardwired to try and pick up on what's authentic or not now. Now, bodies of culture that land in this culture have to pick that up before we even come on the planet. Right. Right. So, so, right. so bodies so, of color. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I don't say bodies of color anymore because because what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to reclaim the idea that I'm actually a human. Right. So, and, so you're saying that the you're formed by the culture. Yeah. Bodies of culture. Yeah. That's okay. Right. Okay. right. And so one of the things that I that happens with the vagal nerve. Yeah. There's two. There's the vagal nerve. I call that the soul nerve. And then there's a muscle, the psoas muscle. Right. Yeah. That psoas is a beast. Right. Because the psoas, what it does is it connects to the top part of the body with the bottom part of the body. It also, if you're braced. Right. It also manages whether or not you mobilize or immobilize. And if you're born to people who are already braced, you pick up in your psoas like this kind of locking down this kind of bracing, right? Right. right. Decontextualized. And so what I've been talking to people about is mm-hmm. how do we begin to do the get the reps in right. with those pieces. So so you're going to need time to condition your body to be able to deal with yes. the aches, deal with the yes. doubt, deal with all of right. that different stuff. You're going to have to right. get up against your own suffering's edge right. before the transformation happens. Right. Right. But you need to condition that. Why do we think that when we talk about race that that's any different? For me to say we're going to have a white body supremacy uh, talk, <laughs> right? <laughs> like deal with the with the root of yeah. this. Stuff. But you can't you can't drop that on people either because they won't be ready to. They'll also brace. It's, but but let me say this. Yeah. So you just did something that I think is very important. Okay. Okay. If anybody can see yeah. me, I physically yeah. like you braced. You was like, no, your face yeah. turned red. Yeah. Right. You like yeah. the whole thing. You're like, yeah. no, you right. Yeah. But see, that's where you start. Mm-hmm. Right there. Yeah. Right. Not in this. Let's bring everybody in and make them all comfortable. Mm-hmm. Bodies of culture are uncomfortable every day. Mm-hmm. White people have the luxury of not being so. Right. Right. And what I'm saying is, is that that idea that like just what you did, that, yeah. you know, that piece right there, that's where you have to start. And white people have to start with that, because I say this all the time. Whenever I do these things, inevitably, I have some white woman that comes up to me afterwards and starts crying. Right. 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 Yeah. White tears, white woman's tears can move a nation. They will move people to mobilize. Yeah. An, an indigenous person, a uh, woman's tears ain't going to move nothing. Mm-hmm. A black woman's tears ain't going to move nothing. Okay. And, and, yeah. so, and so the piece that I, that I say about that is that this idea of being able to land this race question in a way where white people are uncomfortable mm-hmm. is a fallacy. It's performance art. Okay. And— you okay? So you really do say let the bracing begin, yes, and then start healing it there, right there, right there. That's the that, right so there. So that's what all these exercises. There's so many, and there's so much about just ah oh, feeling at home in our bodies. Some of them are really basic things. And They're touch, right? right? They're like when were you t- rubbing your grandmother's hands or the humming the even, humming. which yeah. actually affects yeah, the, vagal the vagal nerve. nerve. Yes, right. Some of these things right. about noticing and one of the exercises you have for white people, yeah. white bodies, mm-hmm. is putting yourself in a situation mm-hmm. with people of color mm-hmm. and noticing what happens in your body and how you feel. Notice the rage. Notice the silence. Notice all of the stuff, and that's the culture building that I'm talking about. That's mm-hmm. the container building. Mm-hmm. I want to read a passage you wrote. Um, let's see. Hey, are we? I feel like we're so animated in here. Okay, I was like worried if the <laughs> microphones are going to be if they can handle it. Um, okay, thirty six. Yeah. Like here, this is something. I mean, you know, there's so many passages I could read, but this it's is so like, cool to watch you read this. I'm, I'm, oh I'm, yeah, yeah, oh, because because, it, yeah. because I'm because tracking it's... you as you're reading, and you, yeah. the, the, there's, I'm, I'm getting this like <laughs> this, this like this. This is why I do my interviews <laughs> remote. <laughs> I don't have to worry about what my body is communicating. <laughs> okay, okay. So just this is one of the ways you like you summarize in not very many words. How confusing and contradictory 
the ways are that culturally we hold our race mm-hmm. and see others. So, so mm-hmm. this is because of white body supremacy. Here is how white, black, and police bodies, because that's all you talk about, police yeah. bodies. Yeah. And we're, we're yeah. not talking about that, but that's a reason to read the book. Yeah. Um, the white body sees itself as fragile and vulnerable, and it looks to police bodies for safety and protection. It sees black bodies as dangerous and needing to be controlled, yet also as potential sources of service and comfort. The black body sees the white body as privileged, controlling, and dangerous. It is conflicted about the police body, which it sees as sometimes a source of protection, sometimes a source of danger, and sometimes both at once. The police body sees black bodies as often dangerous and disruptive, as well as superhumanly powerful and impervious to pain. Which is just, um, like, it's just scratching the surface of just acknowledging what knots we've tied ourselves in, literally. Literally. Our nervous systems are in knots. And and that's the piece that I'm trying to get people to understand, specifically white people, is that yeah. you're going to have to build culture and community to be able to hold this. Your niceness is inadequate to deal with the level of brutality that has occurred. Mm-hmm. Your niceness, I'm glad you're nice to me, but don't attribute that niceness as anti-racist, embodied anti-racist practice. That's why I put the practices in there, right? Right, right. And so that is a very important place that I think white bodies get to sometimes, right? And they either genuflect to process or strategy. Right. And then they never— How do we get they, rid of this? That's right. I'm going to get rid of it. I'm yeah. going to go do some yoga. I'm going to eat a yeah. whole bunch of kale. Yeah. Or what, no, <laughs> but, yeah. but I'm, but I'm going to do yeah, this I did, I did yoga. <laughs> but <laughs> but, but, but yeah. you see what I mean? But, yeah. but, but then the rep is to come back yeah. specifically around race. Come back to you it know, again. You know, you say—you have this image um, in your work um, that, like, part of our civilizational work, our national work, our political work is to each of us settle in our bodies in a new way. And then the image that I love is that we have to settle in our bodies together That's collectively. It. That's it. If I asked you to, like, and you have different exercises mm-hmm. for black bodies and, and white bodies mm-hmm. and police bodies, but would you just kind of demonstrate, yeah. like, for people who would be listening, yeah. who you know, haven't read the book, don't know what we're talking about, you know. A beginning exercise, and it could be a couple of beginning exercises right. for different kinds of people. Right. I'm just going to tweak the, the language a little bit yeah. and, and call it practice. Practice, yeah. Right? Because yeah. exercises, you know, I'm going to do it one time or something, but, but yeah. practices, yeah. I'm going to keep coming back because I want to get better. I also, right? you you um, talked about how your mother and your grandmother, again, yeah. how they just modeled this for yeah. you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. The, that there is no failure, there is only practice. Yeah, so, so, so. In terms of a practice, this is a very simple practice. If you're listening to me right now, one of the things I want you to do is I want you to just to sit for a second. And I want you just to stare straight ahead. Just look straight ahead. And as you're looking straight ahead, just notice what is actually landed and what is actually still kind of in the air. All you're doing is just kind of noticing what's happening, noticing how much you dislike my voice, noticing how much you dislike or you like uh, some of the things that Krista said. Just notice those pieces. Now what I want you to do is look over your left shoulder and use your neck and your hips. So turn and look over your shoulder. And then come back to center and now look up and look down. Come back to center and now look over your right shoulder using your neck and your hips. And the reason why you use your neck and your hips is I want you to engage that psoas and engage the, some parts of the, the vagal. And then now come forward. And now just be quiet and notice what's different. Yeah. Mm. 
Hmm. What did you notice? Well, I was I was kind of aware that I was half thinking about what it was going to come next, but I don't know. I felt more settled. More settled. I felt, and and there was also a feeling of um, there was kind of a feeling of comfort. Yeah, yeah. So one of the things about the animal part of the body is that even though me and you are in this room, this nice place, there is a part of the body, right, that's saying, "Yeah, but what else is going to happen?" Yeah. Right. And the reason why, especially when I'm working with bodies of culture, one of the first things I have them do is orient, just like 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 orient to the room. Right. Mm -hmm. Not orient in a mystical way, but actually Mm -hmm. literally because many times the bodies of culture are waiting for danger, even though, you know, nothing's behind you. Right. Letting the body know it actually helps some pieces. Now, if you get reps in with that, not just do it one time or just when I tell you to, yeah. right? What you, may, what you may notice is that you may have a little bit more room for other, literally, for other things to happen mm-hmm. that can't happen when the constriction is like that. You know, that makes sense, too, in terms of how trauma is in the eternal present. Yep. Like it's not, you're not remembering it, it's reliving itself. That's right. And you're like getting, you know, just for that minute, yeah. you're actually settling in the real present. That's exactly right. Um, and, and then the body goes, oh, you mean that's there too? Right. And then your body starts to do this thing where you go, well, I don't want to do that no more. And then if you can get another, yeah. there's a thing called the, um, uh, the reticular activation system, right? The RAS, right? That it's the thing where will you go buy a car? Mm-hmm. And you say, man, this is a beautiful car. Ain't nobody else got a car like this. There's this color. And then you drive off the lot. You go down five blocks. And you're like, damn, that's the same. Damn, that's the. Everybody got this car, right? It was always there. But now because your brain has said this is important, right. it makes it. Sh- okay. Right? You see it everywhere. You see it everywhere. Yeah. That's why the reps are so important. Right. Because when you get the reps in, it like if you get the that reps in around this race. Everywhere. That's right. Yeah. That's why the reps around race is so important is that yeah. because as you get more reps in about it, all of a sudden other things start to become important that weren't important because now your brain is saying, oh, I need to read that. Oh, I need to pay attention to that. Oh, I need to track her body. Oh, I need to understand that. Oh, I need to ask questions about, right? That and, and now those things become attracted to you, mm. which creates more angst, which forces you to transform. I'm Krista Tippett, and this is On Being, today with clinical therapist and trauma specialist Resma Menakem. It feels important to me right now, at this moment in our life together, there's a lot of um, judging other people, or thinking, can't they just get their act together? Or can't they just see the truth? Can't they just hear the facts? You know, and it happens on every side. That's right. And something that that you know and that you articulate so well is that, um, like, that the vagus nerve also is about safety. That there's, that there's just the core of us, the core of our bodies, is always asking first, "Am I in danger? Am I safe?" Absolutely. And that if we don't. I mean, you really explain this to me in a, in a new way, that if we don't, like, if, if we haven't dealt with that, the facts will not penetrate, even if they have sophisticated words That's put exactly around right. it and strategies, as mm-hmm. you say. Yeah, yeah. That's the missing piece, right, is that we think, if I can just think about this differently— <laughs> Yeah. Right. Then that is in some way going to make it so we can all sing Kumbaya together. And this is why I don't when I do my workshops and I do my experiences, I do not slam white bodies and bodies of culture together because it is unsafe. And we all know it. So some of the ways we're trying to work 
forward, we're actually making ourselves we're hurting unsafe each other. again. We're re-wounding each other, right? Mm-hmm. Some of the things that we go to that, quote unquote, are supposed to help and supposed to heal mm-hmm. really are re-wounding mm-hmm. um, and are violent. Right. 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 There's a constant need to suss out whether or not I'm safe with this white woman or this right. white man or this structure. Right. 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 And so those types of things need to be handled and taken care of with mm-hmm. the amount of legitimacy and the amount of care that they that they should have. Mm-hmm. And to slam people in the room, given the the histories mm-hmm. that our bodies have, have experienced, and just slam people in the room willy nilly mm-hmm. and then say, Let's talk about Race yeah. means that you are you are not giving um, the respect to the issue of race that it deserves. One thing that occurred to me reading your work is, you know, one reason that elders are so comforting and healing and, and children understand that is because. You know, not everybody becomes an elder. Some people just get old. That's right. But if you if you get older <laughs> and wiser, tall. even yeah. a little bit. Yeah. You settle into your body. That's right. That's right. You're just more integrated. You're just more there. Um, there's a line from you, which really is what this all comes down to, which is just so kind of <laughs> sad to think. There's this basic real, human reality that all adults need to learn how to soothe and anchor themselves rather than expect or demand that others soothe them. And all adults need to heal and grow up. And that that what we so many of the things we've done in this culture, especially around the invention of whiteness, mm-hmm. allows people to avoid yes. developing the full range or inhibits people yes. from developing the full range of being a grown up. Yeah, that's the piece that I think gets missed, and I'm so glad you read that. That gets missed um, in that book, right? Mm-hmm. Is that is that when it comes to race, specifically white people not understanding and not getting in and doing the cultural work that needs to be done actually makes you more immature. Yeah. Right. So that's that's a lot of times why when a white person comes to a person of color and tries to white explain about race and what should be happening, mm-hmm. that's why that's why people of color go like are you out of your mind? Mm-hmm. Like I, mm-hmm. like what is what oh people of culture like what is mm-hmm. like how do you even get the temerity? Mm-hmm. To try and explain that to me, yeah. right? And so that's the piece that there's a level of immaturity. It's like yeah. having my 14 year old son, tr- or you know, try and tell me something about life. I'm look, I'm like, <laughs> right. Well, it's also like the the origin of that term, like mansplaining, yeah. right? It's the same way that relationships exactly. between men and women exactly. haven't been grown exactly up. Exactly right. Exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. And again, you know, I just want to reiterate, like you start with. Things that are maybe uncomfortable, but not hard to do, not hard. right? Like put yourself in situations. That's right. That's if you're a white person, That's right. go someplace where there can be a lot of black bodies, That's right. That's right. and just feel what happens in your body, and then and, and go back again. That's right, and then yeah. and then once you get and home, it can be a church service. That's right, and then yeah. once you get home, yeah, pause. The pausing is the most important. Piece. Pause. Mm-hmm. Sit with it. Notice the rage. Now, there are going to be some people that are listening to me and say, well, I, I don't have rage. I don't have rage. Yeah. Watch. Notice that one of your ancestors may show up, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Not as an image, but as a sense. Mm-hmm. And what about, what about a person of color, yeah. an exercise, yeah. like a starting... What well, would your name? Well, th- th- that's a big one, right? Yeah. And so so one, of the, one, one of the things that I would say is for people of culture is whenever, and this is similar to what I did that's more of a general, yeah. whenever you go into a room, even if it's in your own house, stop, use your neck and your hips, and look around okay. and pause. Given our experience in terms of indigenous people, given our experience in terms of black people, um, there has been real things that have happened to us from behind. Getting whipped, having to run, having to fight, all of those pieces... There's a stuckness that can happen in the body that gets passed down 
And by the time you get it, you just have a notion of it. Hmm. Right? It's energetically some notion. Right? And what just the orienting does is allow you to go, okay, I'm not crazy. Because my body just did something that it wasn't doing before I did that. That's it. Mm-hmm. <sighs> There's so many other things I, so many other, pl- but but Can this has been back. amazing. I'd love to come yeah, back and do it no, with you. this is yeah, amazing. Yeah, sure. um, if I ask you, um, through this life you've led and this knowledge you've taken in, and that you teach people, like how how would you say how would you start to answer the question about how your sense of your sense of what it means to be human, yeah. how that is evolving, what, how you'd start to think that through right now. I think what it means to be human is to realize that um, we are ever emerging and that, that, that we are not machines. We are not flesh machines. We are not, you know, robots. We, are, we come from and are part of creation. And that that cannot just be something we talk about when we go to a yoga retreat, right? Mm. That it has to be a lived, emergent ethos. And that, you know, Dr. one of my ancestors, Dr. King, talked about how when people who love peace have to organize as well as people who love war, mm. right? Mm. And for me, what that means is that it's about work. It's about action. It's about doing. It's about pausing. It's about allowing the reason why we want to heal the trauma of racialization is that it thwarts the emergence. Hmm. So let's not do that. Let's condition and and create a create cultures that will allow that emergence to reign supreme so that the intrinsic value can supersede the structural value. Hmm. One of the um, things you... This was one of the (laughs) five anchors for moving through clean pain. The first one, anchor one, Mm -hmm. was shut up. Shut up. Pause. Just shut up. And that's just about learning to check our impulses. That's it. That's it. All of your intelligence, all the thing, all of the smart things you've done. All, this is one of the things that happens with me when I'm done. When I'm done, uh, come off the stage and I'm doing like a book signing. One of the first things that that happens is that white people invariably come up to me and start rolling out their racial resume. Well, you know, I marched with such and such, and mm-hmm. you know, I did this, and you know, I did that. Yeah. How would I know that? How would how does that matter to people of color in your community? Show me how. Right, the, operationally. Mm-hmm. Not because you're rolling out your racial resume. Mm-hmm. And so that's where the shutting up comes into play, right? Mm-hmm. Just stop. Mm-hmm. And notice what's fueling that need to roll out that resume. Where does it land? Where is it coming? Like, just mm-hmm. work with that first. And then when it becomes too much, back out of it, leave it alone, and then come back to it again later. Resma Menachem has a clinical practice in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and teaches and presents widely. His books include the New York Times bestselling My Grandmother's Hands, Racialized Trauma, and the Pathway to Mending Our Hearts and Bodies. The On Being Project is Chris Hegel, Lily Percy, Lauren Drummerhausen, Aaron Colasacco, Eddie Gonzalez, Lillian Vo, Lucas Johnson, Suzette Burley, Zach Rose, Colleen Scheck, Julie Seipel, Gretchen Honnold, Jale Akovan, Padre Gotuma, Ben Cott, Gautam Shrikishan, and Lily Benowitz. The On Being Project is located on Dakota land. Our lovely theme music is provided and composed by Zoe Keating. And the last voice that you hear singing at the end of our show is Cameron Kinghorn. On Being is an independent, nonprofit production of The On Being Project. 
It is distributed to public radio stations by WNYC Studios. I created this show at American Public Media. Our funding partners include the Fetzer Institute, helping to build the spiritual foundation for a loving world. Find them at Fetzer.org. Calliopeia Foundation, dedicated to reconnecting ecology, culture, and spirituality. Supporting organizations and initiatives that uphold a sacred relationship with life on Earth. Learn more at Calliopeia.org. The George Family Foundation, in support of the Civil Conversations Project. The Osprey Foundation, a catalyst for empowered, healthy, and fulfilled lives. The Lilly Endowment, an Indianapolis-based private family foundation dedicated to its founders' interests in religion, community development, and education. And the Ford Foundation, working to strengthen democratic values, reduce poverty and injustice, promote international cooperation, and advance human achievement worldwide. On being is produced by On Being Studios in Minneapolis, Minnesota.